So the ICI Distinguished Lecture of this year is Ron Rivest, and I can start with a cliche that, of course, Ron doesn't need an introduction in this community. We all know his work on RSA, on digital signatures, his very creative work on ciphers and hash functions, the RCX family, the MDX family, which actually um, helped cryptography switch from hardware to software. But Ron also has worked in many other topics of crypto, ideas which he put forward like tweakle encryption, um, certificate management, and SOTSI, he worked on RFID tags, micropayments, voting, and outside crypto also on computer algorithms and machine learning. If I would start enumerating all the honors Ron received, it would take most of his talk, so I will not do that. I just want to mention that he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and of Science, a fellow of the ACM, ICR, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2002, together with Adi Shamir and Lan Edelman, he won the Turing Award. In addition to his academic work, of course, Ron is also known as the founder of our data security, and he has also been very active in the voting community, not only the technical side, but also helping to make voting systems work. So please join me in welcoming Ron. The best. Thank you, Bart. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been 30 years since the first one of these, uh, so it's, a, it's an honor, and I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to come talk. So the talk will not be in Latin. In fact, that's not even Latin. That's, that's mock Latin. Uh, the translation of this is, don't let the bastards grind you down. It's a phrase that originated in World War II, um, and uh, carborundum didn't exist, of course, at the time of the Romans. So it's an abrasive, right? So this is, this is mock Latin. It has its own Wikipedia page if you want to hear more about, about that. So this talk will take us a, actually, it, it, a keynote talk is an opportunity to, to stretch a bit. So this is sort of marginally cryptography. It's related to cryptography, as you'll see, but it, it's not your sort of usual uh, crypto thing. I'm going to introduce some new models and some new questions. But we'll be talking about games that sort of go back and forth, back and forth continually. Uh, in a simple model that uh, reflects that and some results on that. So there'll be some uh, overview, context, uh, and then this particular game that's a model for uh, the situation, uh, I'll call it Flip It, uh, and then some discussion of results within that framework, uh, non-adaptive play first and then adaptive play, and some lessons and some open questions. But the high-level goal is to capture some aspects of the field of security that maybe we're not capturing well yet and, and trying to encourage you to focus more on, on these other kinds of issues. It's not something that's been ignored, but I think it needs more emphasis and, and maybe some new models will help. So cryptography is mostly about using mathematics and secrets to achieve some goals, confidentiality, integrity, and so on. Uh, so the mathematics uh, we're starting to understand pretty well. But it's the managing of secrets that this talk will, will focus more on or emphasize more. So we're making, we make assumptions. We make assumptions that parties can generate good secrets. And we've seen some discussion of that today with, with the, uh, extractors and so on uh, for, for generating secrets and, and keeping them secret. And that's the point I want to focus on today is keeping secrets. Um, we also assume that the adversary can't do certain computations, et cetera. So these are normal assumptions that we make. But things go wrong, right? Murphy's Law says, if anything can go wrong, it will. Uh, so there's no connection with the fact that uh, the beaver is the MIT mascot, but I, that does, that does, that's, whatever. Uh, and things can go wrong badly. The Maginot Line in World War II was built around an assumption by the French that the Germans would not try to attack there. And if they did go around, try to go around it, it would take them too long. And it, it did fail badly. The Germans skirted the defenses quickly. That assumption failed very badly. And now the Maginot Line is a, is a metaphor for building static defenses and, and relying too much on your assumption that they will hold or cause the adversary to take too much trouble to go around them. In an adversarial situation, of course, assumptions may fail repeatedly. I mean, the idea that somebody could fly a plane into a building as, as part of a hijacking scheme and do that more than once uh, showed the, the weakness of our assumptions. And APTs are sort of like that, advanced persistent threats, where adversaries continually 
push against your defenses and, and, and try to get around them in various ways and, and may succeed often. I mean, even now the NSA says, uh, you know, they assume that a certain fraction of their networks are compromised. So most of, most of the crypto that we have today is, is sort of like the Maginot line in its style, right? I mean, we, we design these schemes, we assume that setup has been done properly, that the keys are well, well uh, generated and that they're distributed properly, and then we're ready to play the game. Right, th th then uh, we assume that the adversary is not going to steal the keys. Uh, we've got our Maginot line set, the cryptographic assumptions, and the assumption that the keys will be kept secret is there. That's our Maginot line. So we're, we're, we've, we've made our assumptions. We're going to live behind those lines. Uh, but the theft that, the, the assumption that the adversary won't steal keys is qualitatively a bit different, I think, than the assumption that you know, computations are hard. Because that's a problem that in the real world that somebody has to solve uh, using tools and techniques that are, that are qualitatively, I would argue, much weaker than some of the mathematical complexity th assumptions that we have. It's not a strong assumption, as we've seen over and over again, especially recently. So we have some research in the field that allows us to assume that the adversary can steal keys, or at least portions of them, going back to secret sharing, uh, Adi Shamir in 79, proactive cryptography. And I'm just giving a, a smattering of, of, of citations here. This, excuse me if I haven't listed your favorite paper. Right? Proactive cryptography with uh, Hertzberg, Jarecki, uh, Krauchek, and Young. Signer based intrusion resilient cryptography. Uh, Itkus and Raisin, 04. Uh, leakage resilient crypto. Macaulay and Raisin, 04, for example. Some of these, these, these assume that the adversary can sort of get at some of your key, but not very much of it, or not all of it anyway, and, and that you can manage. So we show that you know, some amount of leakage is, some amount of theft is, is what we can tolerate. But the adversary typically isn't allowed to steal everything. And there are some papers that, that do allow that, uh, uh, intrusion resilient secure channels by uh, Itkus, McNerney, and, and uh, Russell uh, is a nice example of assuming that the adversary can actually steal everything. But we have very little research on what, how to think about keys being stolen entirely. So assuming that the adversary can get some leakage or steal some of the key, that's sort of moving your Maginot line, your digital, your line in the sand a little bit. I assume the adversary is not going to cross that line or maybe not even that line, but that, that's as far as he can go. You know, he's just going to walk all over you. So to be a security professional, there shouldn't be limits on your paranoia, right? The, the adversary is not going to pay attention to your assumptions. He's going to do what he, what he can. So are we being sufficiently paranoid? So I would argue that maybe we're not, that we're um, making up problems for other people to solve uh, that we haven't solved ourselves, how to keep secrets, and, and we're assuming that can be kept, solved well, and uh, that may be false. There's a famous riddle due to our 16th president, uh, Abraham Lincoln. If I call the dog's tail a leg, how many legs does it have? The answer, of course, is four. It doesn't matter what you call, call a tail. It's still a tail, right? <laughs> that was one of his favorite. Well, we have something similar here, right? You know, calling a bit string a secret key doesn't actually make it secret. It right? doesn't do anything towards making a secret. It just points at it and says, that should, somebody's got to keep that secret. Not my job, but you know, somebody should keep that thing secret. Right? It just identifies it as an interesting target for the adversary, really. So labeling it is not the same thing as protecting it. Right? So we do a lot of labeling. That should be secret. That should be secret. That should be secret. We're making a problem for other people to solve. But you know, they've got to be solved. They've got to be solved well. Or we've got to figure out how to deal with a situation when they're not solved well. Maybe that's more the point of this talk. So our goal here is to develop a new model or new models for scenarios involving total key loss and related scenarios, especially and this is the new point, where the, where the theft is covert, right? So it sometimes happens your password gets stolen or, or your secret key gets stolen, and you don't know it, right? That's an interesting scenario. That's one that we should be caring about as, as security professionals. What do you do? How do you think about those situations? How do you, how do you model them? What, do, what can you do? Uh, so I'm going to be introducing a model that tries to capture at least some aspects of those situations where the theft is stealthy, where the theft is covert. You don't know that you've been hacked. Okay, maybe until later. All right. 
So I'm going to do this in the framework of a game. So that, that, that was all motivation. And so I'm going to present a, a game here. It's a very simple two-person I think you'll enjoy it. Very simple two-person game that tries to capture, capture this and give some, some uh, initial results. Now, this is very much sort of work in progress or preliminary, but I encourage you to think about these kinds of models and, and what we can do, or how to model these kinds of situations better, too. So this is joint work with uh, folks at RSA Labs, Ari Jules, Alina Opre, Martin Van Dyke. And uh, so we'll talk about the game of Flip It. And they've been thinking about some of the results. And actually, there's, there's some work that uh, may be available on the web soon where you can actually play this game online if you like. So as I said, it's a very simple game. It's a two-player game. There's a uh, defender who's player zero and an attacker who's player one. And, and this is supposed to be blue and red. Can you tell the difference in the colors? I think that's OK. So blue and red. Um, here. So these, these are the two players. It's a very, pretty, very much a symmetric game, um, aside from the move cost. So the players will have a different cost of moving. Um, and you'll see how this works in just a second. So there's some contested resource uh, or critical resource, uh, and it could be a password or a secret or something like this that uh, the game is about. And so this is just abstract in this situation. It, it's the, the thing that's being fought, fought over by these two players, um, the security of the password, the security of the digital key. But th this model also uh, applies equally well to other things like computer systems, where the computer system can either be hacked or not, uh, or maybe a mountain pass if you want a military situation, right? So a mountain pass could be secured by one side or the other. So we've got some contested resource. And the state of that resource is binary. It can either be in a good state or a bad state. So in the case of a password, it might be secure, secret, or it might be guessed or stolen, so compromised. Clean or compromised for your key, controlled by the defender, controlled by the text. So it's a binary system. That, that's, it's a very simple one, right? So blue or red. So two players. Each player has his corresponding favorite state. And a player can move to put the game into his state at any time. So the defender can move and put the game into the state resource into his state. So in the case of a password, he might initialize the password or change his password, reset the password. He might recover the computer system, put it back into a clean state. He might disinfect, get rid of the virus or the malware or whatever. So, so there's some move, I'm just calling it abstractly a move, that the good guy can take that puts it into a, a good state. And correspondingly, there's some move that the bad guy can do that puts it into the bad state. It's compromised. Uh, it's cr he corrupts somebody. He uh, installs malware. He steals it. He steals the password. He infects it. Right. So that's all there is. There's those two kinds of moves. One move for the good guy. One move for the bad guy. And they they can move at any time. And time is continuous here. It's convenient to have continuous time rather than discrete time. Unlike most games, this is, this is not staged or anything like this. So somebody can steal your password any time whatsoever. So time is continuous, not discrete. And uh, so players move at the same time with probability zero. We assume that so that uh, we don't have to worry about what happens if they both try to move at the same time. So in the password case, creating a new password or signing key, stealing it. I think I said these before. Reinstalling the system software, using a zero-day attack to install a rootkit uh, would be a move by the attacker. Sending soldiers to the mountain pass by either side would uh, represent a move for the mountain pass game. So there's a very simple game. So it's continual back and forth warfare. You can take over, they can take over, you can take over again, they can take over at some point. So the attacker can take over at any time. There's no such thing as a perfect defense here. Unlike most crypto where we talk about building our defenses and living behind them, you know, this is a situation where the attacker can take control whenever he wants to. And the only option for the defender is to retake it later. So it goes on forever, perhaps. So moves can be stealthy. This is the unique aspect of this game. In practice, compromise is often undetected. Here we assume that players don't know when the other player moves. All right, so this is unusual. I've been trying to find things in the game literature where game theory literature, where you don't know when the other player moves. There's a little bit of it, but very little. I mean, there's some imperfect monitoring is the buzzword you'll find it under. But it's, uh, 
I haven't seen this game studied at all. So the players don't know when, if your machine is infected with malware, you don't know that it happens. And if you change your password, the adversary may not know that you've changed your password until later. So your uncertainty about the state of the system increases over time, right? So you, you move and you've taken control, but then as time evolves, you don't know whether you've retained control or not. So your move, when you move, might be a flip where you've taken control, or it might be what we call a flop, where it has no effect. It's useless. You change your password unnecessarily. It would be a flop. So flops are sort of unavoidable. So what do you know about the state of the system? What's your feedback? So you only learn about the state of the system when you move. So in general, if you're not moving, you're, you're not seeing anything new about the system. When you move, you can find out. And we can have different models for different aspects. So like when you change your password, do you know whether your password was compromised or not? So in, in the basic Flippit game, we assume that when you move, you find out the complete history of moves by both players. So you find out not only you know, was your password compromised, but you find out if it was compromised, when it was compromised, and maybe other moves that the other player made. So you, that, that's sort of the maximum amount you could hope to get. Uh, you could certainly study variants of the game where you learn less, like you just learn whether it had been compromised or not, or maybe you don't even learn much of anything. We'll study some of those too. So you might find the time since the player last moved or, or whatever. So in real life, moving, uh, in these examples, moving costs something, right? Changing your password takes effort. You've got to write it down on the sheet of paper you attach to your computer or whatever, put it in your wallet or whatever you do. Um, you know, you've, you've got some cost to something. Reinstalling the system software costs something. Attacking costs something. If you're the attacker, attacking costs something. So moves aren't for free. So we assume just some abstract model that says player I, when he moves, it costs him K sub I points. And so the defender plays K sub zero to move, and the attacker pays K sub one. We don't make them the same necessarily. I think it's important that they could be different. In fact, the difference between these two is, I think, an important part of the, the modeling here. So there's a move cost. Um, and the point of the game is to be in control, right? You want to have a system that's secure from abuse by the adversary, or you want your password to be uh, clean, uncompromised. So we'll assume that the player earns one point for every second that he's in control. All right, so now we've got the, the basic framework here. We've got moves. We've got a state, state of the system. Uh, now we've got a scoring function so that we can, you pay to move. And when you take move, you take control, and you gain one point per second of being in control. If, it, if you're the defender and it costs you k sub 0 to move, then you hope that you're going to get at least k sub 0 seconds of benefit, because you need that to pay pay back the benefit. Otherwise, you're getting negative benefit, and you might as well not, not play. Uh, and similarly, the attacker wants to be in control for at least k1 seconds on the average to pay for his move. So how well are you playing? If you have a, two players playing over time, you can count how many moves you've made, right? Uh, so the number of moves made by player i, n sub i of t is the number of moves he makes up to time t. And his rate of play, then, is alpha sub i of t just n sub i of t divided by t. So you can have some rate of play. And that corresponds to your rate of expenditure for the moves, of course, too. And you have some rate of being in control, right? So that at each time, either one player or the other is in control. So g sub i of t can be the number of seconds you're in control up to time t. Gamma sub i is the rate at which you're gaining benefit from being in control. And then your score, your benefit, is just the difference between the amount of time you're in control, and k sub i, your move cost, times the number of moves you made up to a given time. And your rate of benefit then is just that divided by t. So gamma sub i is your rate of gain, minus k sub i times your uh, rate of moving. So the players want to maximize the limit, limiting rate of benefit. So this is not a zero-sum game, right? The players can, can move at different rates, and, and they can both move very fast and pay a lot and, and get not much benefit out of it, or they could both play slowly, and maybe they do better. Uh, so there's, there's not a zero-sum game here. We're sort of assuming that each player is playing to maximize his own benefit, as in typical two-person non-zero-sum games. Right, so these, but each player will have his own benefit rate that he wishes to maximize. So here's a, uh, I made a little movie. So here, you know, it's just 
sort of obvious what's going on here. So the red circles represent attack, attacking moves by the adversary. The blue circles are attacking moves by the defender. And uh, right, you play along, and the defender's in control. He starts off the game playing, and then all of a sudden he's hacked. But he doesn't know this. Right? So now the attacker's in control. The defender doesn't know. The defender plays. He may find out at that time that he, he, he was hacked. And maybe he sits around. Maybe he plays again. He doesn't know, right, he, what's going on. He plays again. Uh, and uh, his cost at any time, right, at this point, we can see we've played a, a bit of the game. The attacker's been in control five and a half seconds. Two moves, it costs three each. You're giving a score. Of, he's got a negative score at this point. The defender's played three times, uh, been in control for 15 seconds, and has a cost of 12. Right. Very simple game. This is a very, very simple game. Now, from the uh, defender's point of view, right, just to emphasize, right, you only get feedback when you move. So here the defender has moved once, but he doesn't know now who, whether he's in control or not. He's actually been hacked. When he moves, he finds out, oh my god, I've been hacked, right? Now he still doesn't know if he's in control anymore. Is the adversary going to play again? He tries again. He's got a flop. And maybe he just waits it out in this case. He waits out. So you, get, you only get information when you move. That just, just emphasize that point. All right. So the question, how do you play this game well? Right? So this is a model of a situation where you can be hacked, and then you can undo the hack, and you can be hacked again, and, and you don't know anything until you've... Uh, moved yourself, how, and you've got a scoring system, you want to be in control, minus the cost of your moves. How do you, how do you play this game well? So, non-adaptive play, let's start with that. Right? So, when you move, you, you get information about the other player's history of moves, and you could pay, try to figure out what he's doing and, 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 and uh, do that. But let's start with a simple case and look at non-adaptive play, where, in fact, your moves are pre-programmed. They don't depend on what the other party does. So a non-adaptive strategy plays on blindly without attention to the other player's moves. Right? That's one class of strategies you could have. Right? So you just make up your list of moves ahead of time, if you will, right? an infinite list. So there's some interesting non-adaptive strategies. For example, periodic play. You can just move every so often. You change your password every 90 days. Right? That's periodic play. You reboot your system every morning or whatever. For, right? so that's periodic play. You could have exponential play. You could have play where the, um, at any given instant of time, your probability is the same of playing. Right? It's a Poisson process. Right, so you have an exponential play. Or you could have a renewal strategy where the time between moves is determined by some probability distribution that you pick. Right, sort of a generalization of those two. Well, there's three classes of interesting non-adaptive strategies. So let's look at periodic play. It turns out to be quite interesting. So a player may play periodically with some rate, alpha sub i, and period 1 over alpha sub i, of course. So for alpha, uh, alpha 0 equals 1 third, the defender might just play every third step. I want to assume here that there's a little bit of jitter or drift in the moves. Otherwise, an adaptive player will easily, you know, or two, two um, so the adaptive player can anyway play well, but the non-adaptive player even can sync up. So I don't want these strategies, periodic play versus periodic play, to sync up at all. So we're going to assume there's a little, periodic doesn't mean exactly periodic. Periodic means, you know, you, if you're playing with period three, you're moving three plus or minus a little bit of jitter, and it, that will tend to drift. So that's convenient for the analysis and the assumptions to work out. I mean, you could talk about precisely periodic case, then you've got a bunch of degenerate cases to worry about, too. So if you, even if you've got a little bit of jitter, though, an adaptive player can easily learn what you're doing, right? So if you're, play, if you're the defender and you're changing your, rebooting your system every morning, um, you know, the attacker can, once, once he learns that, because every time he moves, he learns that history, he can learn your period and your phase, and he can just take over the system. If you, if you reboot your system at 9 a.m., he can re 
take over at 9.05 a.m. And, and you've had it. So uh, periodic play doesn't work very well against an adaptive attacker, unless you're playing very fast. If you're playing so fast that the ad attacker doesn't have time to uh, get his benefit before, before the, uh, you play again, then, then he's not, uh, not going to play. So essentially he's making his regular rounds. That's the classic movie situation where you see the guy go around the castle every 10 minutes and you watch and then you go right after, sneak in right afterwards or your 90-day password is there. So with a periodic attacker uh, against a periodic defender, let's look at that case. It's actually quite interesting. So suppose the attacker is moving periodically at some rate alpha 1 and you're the defender, you know that, and you're going to play a periodic strategy. What's, what's your optimal defender strategy in the case that you're being attacked by a periodic attacker? So if you have the attacker's playing quickly, you shouldn't play at all because you'll have negative benefit, right? So if the attacker's playing with period, sorry, with rate bigger than 1 over 2k0, then his intervals are smaller than 2k0. And you, as a defender, need a K0 interval in order to get your benefit and to, to, to pay for your move. So on the average, you're going to get half of the interval of the adversary. So 2K0 is sort of the limiting point. And if it's, the intervals are shorter than that, the attacker's intervals are shorter than that, you shouldn't be playing at all. If the attacker is leaving you intervals of exactly 2K0, then you, should, you can play. I mean, it doesn't matter much. You can play not at all, or you can play up to a certain rate. But you're not going to get any benefit at all. You're going to get, on the average, half of the attacker's intervals. You're going to get just enough to pay for your moves, and that's it, no more. And, and therefore, you can play that, but you get no benefit. On the other hand, if the ad adversary is more leisurely, you can play for positive benefit. So you, have, uh, you can play periodically uh, at some rate alpha 0. And if you do a little bit of the calculus and optimize, it turns out you want to play faster than the adversary. And this is the optimum rate that maximizes your net benefit. So graphically, we can display that here to look at the situation for uh, periodic attacker and periodic defender. Here we've got a graph with uh, the rate of play by the defender, uh, 1 6, 1 3rd, 1 half, 2 thirds. Rate of play by the attacker. And let's look at first at the optimum rate of play by the defender, the theorem we just saw, for the attacker. And I'm assuming here that we've got uh, cost of one for the defender and cost of one and a half, say, for the attacker. So if the attacker is playing quickly, rate a half or greater, then he's not leaving you intervals that are big enough for you to play in. Uh, you shouldn't play at all. Your rate is, is zero. If the attacker is playing exactly with rate a half, his intervals are size two, doesn't matter what you play, you're in this range. And if you're attacker is nice and playing slower than a half, he's leaving you some breathing room, playing periodically with a rate alpha zero. Here, following this curve is what you want to be doing. So this is alpha zero, optimum alpha zero is a function of alpha one. So this is the dependent variable. It's, and then we, so either he's, he plays zero rate if he's playing too quickly, doesn't matter here, and it jumps up and then comes back down. Symmetrically, the attacker has a similar curve, slightly offset, right? So if you're playing too quickly as defender, he's got a, a cost of one and a half. So if he's, um, if you're playing with a rate a third or bigger, your intervals are size three, he's getting half of those on the average. So if you're playing a third or bigger, he has no motivation to play whatsoever. He's going to have negative benefit. Uh, if you're playing exactly one third, um, and he can play any, anywhere in that range. Otherwise, so this is just the flip of the curve you just saw. Otherwise, he plays uh, like this. And we, the question is, where are these players going to end up playing, right? So if you, they both know they're going to play um, periodic strategies, uh, the, the Nash equilibrium, of course, is where these cross, where they're not motivated to change at all. It doesn't mean they're going to play at this Nash equilibrium, but this is what you have, right? You have a Nash equilibrium at defender playing at rate one third, attacker playing at rate two ninths. And that's where these curves cross. And at this point, uh, they are sharing the resource in the ratio of 2 thirds to 1 third. So the, uh, 
gamma, the gamma rates, the rates of control are, are in the ratio of two-thirds to one-third. The rates of benefit are one-third and, and zero. So the defender is gaining here. His move costs are less. He can play faster. And so he's getting positive benefit. And he's forcing the adversary at best to play on this, this part of the, the curve here, where the adversary gets no benefit whatsoever. So he's, the adversary might as well drop out. This is not a stable equilibrium. Uh, the, the defender might just play a little bit faster and cause the adversary to, to drop out and get more gain. Uh, but then the adversary would jump in, back in. So it, it's not a stable situation, particularly. You know, game theory is hard to figure out what players will actually do, and you end up with situations like this where you know, maybe somebody will invest some time to, to uh, force you out for a while, or, or uh, this seems like the most likely point for them to end up, though. All right, so that's periodic play. Nobody said you have to play periodically, of course, right? So exponential play is an interesting possibility. This is a kind of process that uh, uh, is well studied because it's memoryless, right? So every time you look at an interval of time dt, your chance of playing in that time interval is the same, independent of what you played previously. Right? So this is a Poisson process. Uh, you have a probability of a delay x of being at most most x is going to be 1 minus e to the minus alpha 1x for the, for the attacker. All right, so you, it looks random, right? It's just, it's just uh, it's raindrops falling on your tin roof or whatever. There's, there's no correlation between the time of one move and time of the other. And compared to the periodic display, the intervals are high variance, right? You have mean 1, but you'll have variance 1 as, or standard deviation is 1 as well. So they could be high, higher variance. And that makes it easier to play in the larger gaps, as we'll see. So we can make the same kind of graph for exponential play versus exponential play as we did for periodic play versus periodic play. And so here's the same graph with the rates for the defender, the move rates for the attacker. And let's look at the defender strategy then as a function of the attacker's rate of play. If the attacker's playing at rate more than, let's make this line, more than one, then the attacker's playing too quickly. There's no point in the defender playing. He won't get any benefit whatsoever. But once the attacker plays at rate slower than one, it, it's worthwhile for the defenders to start playing. We don't have that straight line business and, and, and curve here. Here, one, once the mean time between plays by the attacker is less than one, then the average waiting time, the average control time for the defender, once he makes a move, is going to be uh, at least one. Right? So that's because it's memoryless. So that once the defender moves, the time to the next attacker move is going to be at least, at least one. And so it's going to be worthwhile for him to jump in and start playing. And so you get a curve like this for the optimum rate of play by the defender for various rates of play by the attacker. And the optimum rate of play, it's not hard to figure out, by the defender as a function of the attacker's rate of play, alpha 1, is just square root of alpha 1 over k0 minus, minus alpha 1. That's this curve. Okay. So that maximizes the net benefit rate to the defender if uh, if the attacker has these various rates. So that's the curve for the defender's optimum play given the attacker's rate of play. And symmetrically, or almost symmetrically, I've got, again, a slight difference because the costs are different here for the two players. The cost of the adversary is, moves is one, one and a half. So uh, his point of uh, where it starts becoming worthwhile is when the defender starts playing with rate less than two thirds. So similar kind of shape and the Nash equilibrium for this one, uh, it's where these two curves cross, is uh, at the point alpha 0, alpha 1, the two rates are 6 25ths and 4 25ths. Right? So in the, the ratios of rates of play correspond to the uh, cost, the 3 to 2 ratio. And this equilibrium looks like a stable one to me. I, I, think, uh, I think that's right. It looks like a you can tell by the slopes of these curves, and whether it's you know a little bit of, a little bit of deviation, then a 
force you back towards it or not. And this looks like a stable equilibrium. Whereas the one for the periodic um, play it doesn't seem like one. So the rates of gain uh, are, again, three to two. And so the defender is in control 60% of the time. The attacker is in control 40% of the time. And the net benefit rates, they're both positive in this case. So they're, the optimum, at the, at the equilibrium here, they're, they're sharing the resource 60%, 40%. And getting both getting positive benefits, so this corresponds to the kind of situation where you know you're, you're living with some parasites or something, right? You got some some malware, and it, it's you know you got you got to live with the bad guy some of the time, right? And that, that's you know a qualitative feature of this model that seems to reflect reality as well. You can't keep them, you can't have perfect defense, you can't keep them out all the time, but you can figure out how to play, how to how to adjust your strategy, try to keep them out as much as possible, and get your own maximum gain considering the cost of your moves as well. So I consider that qualitative aspect of this, you know, reflective of reality and interesting. So the third kind of non-adaptive strategy is renewal strategies, right? So this is a generalization of, of those two, right? Both periodic and exponential strategies had probability distributions that said, well, once you've made one move, the time to your next move is, is determined by some probability distribution, an exponential delay or just a fixed delay in the case of a periodic. So in general, the generalization of that is a renewal distribution, where you've got a probability distribution that you can pick, whatever you like, but you use it every time after you've moved until your next move. So the probability of uh, your delay being less than or equal to x is determined by some distribution f sub i that's unspecified. And it's, it's, you specify it to, to choose your moves. So these are a large class of, of moving strategies. Uh, and includes the periodic and exponential, as I said. Uh, and there's lots of others. Uh, if you look at the literature on stochastic processes, the term rene renewal process defines precisely this kind of a sequence of, of uh, events. So one of our major results is, is this one here, that the, uh, if your opponent is playing a renewal strategy of any sort whatsoever, so as long as, if your opponent is playing a renewal strategy and you want to play a, a uh, renewal strategy yourself, that optimizes, then your op optimal renewal strategy is going to be periodic, or maybe not playing if he's playing too quickly. Right. So periodic play, in the case of non-adaptive play, is in fact optimal for non-adaptive playing, right? or at least for renewal playing. Right. So we've got, um, you might think that having more Unpredictability would be helpful, but in fact, you know, we're talking about non-adaptive play here where the players don't see how you're playing. And so periodic play is, is fine. The proof notes, um, there's this nice classic exercise in statistics about the waiting time for the bus versus the average time between the buses, right? So you go to a, a bus stop, right? If, if the buses come periodically every 10 minutes and you go to the bus stop, then it's going to be five minutes until the bus arrives. But if you go to the, if the buses arrive with some other distribution, you know, the, the average time between buses and the average time you have to wait for the bus if you, when you arrive at the bus stop, those are different random variables. They're related. And the one you care about, really, is the average time to wait for the bus, uh, the average time until the attacker moves if you're the defender. So these are different distributions. In the case of the exponential, right, I mean, the average time between them is the same as the amount you have to wait, as I said, right, once you arrive there. It's a memoryless process, so the average time for the next bus is the average time between buses, because the average time between from any given point to the next one is, is the same. So most of the analysis has to do with the, the waiting time, which, if you flip it around, is the time since the last one, too. Um, so size biased interval sizes, what we call them, or what they're usually called. Um, and one of the key insights is that a periodic strategy minimizes the variance of the interval size. So if the adversary steps in the middle of an interval, then you minimize his expected gain by having a periodic strategy, because then it will, his waiting time will be precisely one half of your interval size. Whereas if you've got some variance, some positive variance in your move sizes, you're giving him, uh, because of the difference between these two notions, you're giving him some benefit, and he will, he will gain. So minimizing the variance in your moves turns out to be a good intuitive strategy. So I won't give you the details of the proof, but it's, those are some of the notions. So adaptive play. So adaptive play is hard. 
Right? This, this is a, a tough game for that. Because um, we saw periodic, periodic uh, play isn't very effective. Uh, that it, a learning adversary can just learn you know, what your period is and your, your phase and, and defeat you. So if you're going to play against an adaptive adversary, which, what should you do? Well, if both players are adaptive, um, it's not hard to at least intuitively see that we've got a game that's at least as complicated as iterated prisoner's dilemma there, here, right? If you've got a situation um, where both players can learn what the other player is doing, they can uh, compete in interesting ways. They can also cooperate in interesting ways. Prison, prisoner's dilemma is the classic game where uh, players can uh, cooperate or defect and, and if you play Prisoner's Dilemma in an iterated way, Axelrod had a nice book talking about strategies for playing iterated Prisoner's Dilemma. You can do tit for tat where you, where you play uh, the same way that you cooperate or defect the uh, previous round. So here uh, you can view it as, as being very similar with slow and fast being very much like cooperate and defect, right? So if you have a choice between, say, playing slow at rate Point one, say you're playing on the average once every 10 moves, and fast, where you're playing point two, you're playing once every five. Uh, and the, the, so this is the attacker and the defender has got the same choices. And uh, if they were playing periodically, so you're just restricting it to those two strategies. So here's the payoffs for the defender, point four and point five five. In the case of the attackers playing slow, you're the, the defender is better off playing faster. He'll, increases gain from 0.4 to 0.5. And similarly, if the attacker's playing fast, uh, the defender is still better playing off fast himself. So he goes from minus 0.1 to 0.3. So from the defender's point of view, it's always better to play fast. That's a dominant strategy. And it's symmetric. So here I've got the cost being the same for both players. So from the attacker's point of view, he's better off playing fast in the first row and better off playing fast in the second row. Second row. So this is a classic prisoner's dilemma, kind of two by two matrix, and you have all of the, com the richness and complexity then of iterated prisoner's dilemma. They can cooperate, they can decide both to play slowly, right? So you're doing an adaptive game, they can say, well, you know, I'll, I'll let the adversary take over my machine on weekends when I don't care anyway, and then I'll take over, whatever. They can cooperate in various ways. Um, so uh, it's complex. Nonetheless, as a, as a defender, you can say, well, how do I deal with an adaptive adversary? I've got an attacker who's going to try to figure out what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm sending the sentries out. Uh, he's going to be watching them. What kind of pattern should I send those sentries out on? He's going to try to figure out the, the, the pattern of, of play. So exponential is a pretty good strategy for this in this case, right? So exponential means you're acting in a, if you're the defender, you're acting in a memoryless manner. So there's nothing really for the opponent to learn except your average rate of play. So if you're playing an exponential strategy, then as we saw earlier, the optimum strategy for the attacker is to play periodically um, or not, not to play at all. Um, so Adaptivity doesn't help if you're playing with an exponential strategy because there's nothing to learn except your rate of play, and that's, that's fixed. Right, so there's no more. So graphically, um, the situation looks like this. Right, so you have the, the defender. Here, here's the, you, give, you give up something by playing exponentially, but maybe not that much. Right, so here's a graph that shows the defender. You're, you're the defender. You're playing at rate 0.25, say. Uh, so you, you're committed to spending at that rate just to get it, make the graph two-dimensional. So we've got a, your, your rate is fixed. And let's start off with the case where the attacker is playing periodically with a rate that varies. So here we've got the independent variable, which is the attacker's rate. So this is alpha 1, not alpha 0. So as the attacker plays faster, your net benefit, you're the defender, this is beta zero is your net benefit, your net benefit goes from about three quarters down to, to zero. You're right. So as, as he plays faster, you're gaining less and less, of course, and eventually you'll, you'll drop out at this point, as we saw. So 
that's a non-adaptive attacker, right? And as he plays faster, you're doing worse, according to this curve. If, can you see that? I think green's okay. So if he's adaptive, you say, oh, goodness, I've got an adaptive attacker. What do I do? Well, I can play exponentially. I can have a memoryless attack at the same rate, mem memoryless strategy at the same rate. And now my benefit curve starts looking like this. I paid a penalty by becoming adaptive, right? So I've got a curve that starts off at the same point here. but it, there's a gap, but he can't do any better than this. This is something I can guarantee, even with the best adaptive attacker, independent of complexity, theoretic assumptions, or anything else. You know, I, just the uncertainty in my moving means that I can guarantee benefit at this rate for, uh, for myself, no matter how the, how the attacker plays. So I paid a penalty because he's become adaptive, I've become exponential, um, and one of the big open questions here is, is there a better defender? Right? What, what can be argued? Um, you know, what, is there an optimum defense strategy? Right? And I think there's got to be things that are better. I don't know how to prove them yet. But I, you know, it seems like there should be curves in between these two. So given a fully adaptive attacker that can do whatever he likes, you know, the exponential defender has a lot of variance in his moves. It's memoryless, which makes it easy to argue that the adaptive strategy isn't going to help much, but it's also got a lot of variance in the moves. And as you move, want to move towards the periodic rate of gain here, you think cutting the variance down. So using other kinds of variables, maybe gamma distributions or, or something else, uh, maybe waiting a bit and then just doing a little normal curve or something. So you've got, it's a bit like periodic, but a little more variance in periodic, so it's unpredictable. Now how do you trade those two off? The predictability, you know, variance trade-off here is, is the important one. So we've got two, two, end, two extremes, the periodic defender and the exponential defender. There's got to be interesting things in the middle that should be analyzable. That's an open question. So lessons and open questions. So I think, uh, you know, we, we can't just stick with the Maginot line philosophy in this community. We've really got to be prepared to, to deal with total loss of, of key material um, repeatedly. Uh, you know, I think, I think that uh, the world has shown us that you know, labeling something as a secret key isn't sufficient, and that just because you've labeled it as a secret key and you've given it to the systems guys and said, you know, keep that secret, that doesn't mean it's going to work very well. Uh, and we've seen lots of cases where uh, you know, secrets get, get compromised repeatedly. So um, I'm not sure sure how we as cryptographers can help that much. But we have to be prepared for dealing with that assumption in particular as being a particularly weak one, I think. Our other assumptions of computational complexity, I think, are much stronger. But uh, the, the ability to keep secrets is, is one that um, we should think harder about and be better prepared to deal with with models like this or others. Play fast. Right? So if you're in this kind of situation, you want to uh, play quickly. You want to force the other player to drop out, if possible. Um, so change your passwords frequently. Reboot your server frequently. Uh, that's good play on your part, in the sense that it makes it harder for the adversary, and, and he may drop out. You may, I mean, there's optimizations to do, of course, too. And one of the big uh, lessons here, I think the, the big morals for me, anyway, is, is we should be paying more attention to these co the costs of these moves, right? Because the costs are going to be driving everything. So what's the cost of changing your password? What's the cost of putting your system into a clean state? Uh, you want to arrange the game so that your costs are a lot less than the other player's costs. All right, so these are system kinds of questions. Uh, and we're seeing progress in that direction. The, the use of virtual machines to give you a, a, clean, a fresh image of, of your system. Uh, easily and quickly uh, means you as a defender have a, have a low move cost. Because uh, when, when your costs are cheaper than the opponent's cost, you can move more quickly than they can. You can force them to drop out and, and uh, get essentially full benefit. So this is a moral, maybe not so much for us as cryptographers, but for the system security folks to say, you know, how do we think harder about getting a system back to a good state cheaply? That's the key operation here. So some open questions. Um, so.
So we proved that the optimal renewal strategy against a renewal strategy is periodic. Um, it's not quite the same as proving that the optimum non-adaptive strategy against a renewal strategy is periodic. Right? So renewal is a subclass of non-adaptive, right? And uh, there may be non-adaptive strategies that aren't renewal strategies that do better against a renewal strategy, but there's a gap there in what we were able to show. So we only analyzed renewal strategies against renewal strategies. What's the best non-adaptive strategy against an arbitrary renewal strategy? And the conjecture is that that's also periodic. What's the optimal renewal strategy against, say, maybe an adaptive rate-limited adversary? So you assume there's a bound on how fast the adversary can move, um, say. And then you want to say, what's the best way to move yourself? Given that he's adaptive, he can learn what you're doing. And again, this gets back to the interpolating between those two curves, trying to find a way of balancing the uh, predictability of having a periodic play, which is nice because it's got small variance, and unpredictability with higher variance, but then gives more gaps for the adversary to fit into. Um, so gamma distri distribution, distributed variables. A gamma di variable is just the sum of a number of ex exponential variables. It seems to have the nice class of properties that uh, I would conjecture would maybe be a good answer here. But they're hard to analyze, because once you get away from the memory list property, then adaptive play, what's, you know, what's the best adaptive play against such a, uh, a strategy? It's, it's not easy to think about. Um, if you play a fixed renewal strategy, like some combination of exponential and something else maybe, what's the best, can you, can you lower bound how well an adaptive adversary can do? Again, it's a question of analysis. How, how do you analyze best possible adaptive play against a given strategy that you're announcing? So you'd like to, I like to adopt this strategy of you know, half the time moving in three steps and half the time moving in five or something like that. How do you analyze what the adversary can do against that? Uh, what learning theory algorithms? So you know, how do we develop good adaptive strategies? I think there's a lot of, a lot of room to be done here. Some of the reinforcement learning um, literature yields strategies which may be applicable here. Um, time delay, TD learning, and, and some of these other ones uh, look like they might apply to this sort of game a bit, depending on the strategy that you're playing. Is it, with the renewal strategy. Other open questions. Uh, the game generalized in lots of ways. You could have multiple players, of course. Uh, a mountain pass could be controlled by any one of three players. Uh, you hear of software that, uh, malware that uh, boots out the other malware and then takes over the machine. Right? So you have malware one, malware two, and then you as a defender. Um, other feedback models. Um, so the game here was the simplest possible one. You, you play, you take control, and you learn everything about the game there. But you could have other feedback models. Um, you could have a, a model that says uh, you just learn whether, you had, whether it was a flip or a flop when you move, uh, for example. Or a low-cost check, right? I mean, you, you, uh, the one that's here, you could have a second kind of move. You have one that takes control, and you reflash your system. But you could have a, a, a virus check that says, you know, is it in fact, what, what's the state? Is it a good state or bad state? So maybe that's cheap, and then it costs you a lot more to, to, this makes the game harder to think about, of course, but maybe a little more realistic. Um, how to structure a, a PKI when anybody can get hacked. I think this is an interesting direction to go in, right? So we've got PKIs right now that assume there's, there's uh, trusted third parties that don't get hacked. Um, and maybe that's right, maybe they don't get hacked. They put a lot of effort into to managing uh, the security of their root keys and so on. But uh, it's interesting to think about a world in which uh, you know, anybody can get hacked and any key can be compromised. And you want to have a move then which refreshes it, reestablishes its good character. Um, and how do you build a public key infrastructure in such a world? And this might be a way to come up with a much more robust PKI. I mean, right now, the ones we have feel somewhat fragile and, and, and brittle. And, and maybe one where you're constantly changing your keys actually is a, is a way to having a more uh, lively and secure and robust kind of system. So there may be an a interactive version of this game. The, the folks at RSA were working on some uh, implementation. It's not ready yet. A paper will be posted on this stuff at this, this site as well. Uh, but uh, it'd be a fun game for an app, I think. You have two, two little smartphones, and you're pushing your buttons to take control, right? I think. 
anybody wants to implement that, let me know if you, they may have them. So that's it, basically that's what I wanted to cover a little bit early, but uh, so I hope you found uh, the themes interesting. I think there's a, a set of questions that we're not asking in this community about dealing with total key loss, and I hope that this will stimulate you to think about uh, these directions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Any questions for Ron? Thanks, Ron. This, this is fascinating. It really feels like the beginning of a whole new line of research. Um, and it, it seems like it can be taken in so many different directions. And one that I, I wonder if you've thought about is the possibility of the uh, attacker and defender having different goals. Um, uh, an, an example might be where my goal is to get my banking done um, and um, the uh, uh, attacker's goal is to just run a botnet for as long as possible. So I might run a malware scan right before my banking, knowing that the attacker will own the, my machine most of the time. And we're both relatively happy under those circumstances. <laughs> Good question. I hadn't, we hadn't thought about that kind of thing. But we're trying to keep it, this, the first model as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is, what are the, what are the simple next steps for, the, for modeling? And, and, and uh, that's one direction we hadn't thought about. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? So, I guess we're all hungry, so let's thank Ron again for a very interesting and thought-provoking talk. <laughs>